So I'm Yago. Uh, hi. Uh, I'm a tech lead and co-founder at Kimfolk. Uh, I guess you've heard about Kimfolk, being that you are at this conference and there's a logo everywhere. Uh, but yeah, uh, basically we are a software consultancy. Uh, we're a team of software developers that help companies to work on their open source projects when they don't have resources or they don't have the expertise needed. And, uh, but recently, we have a bit of a shift. So uh, we forked CoreOS Container Linux, and we called it Flatcar. And we are offering support for that. And soon, we'll be announcing some other uh, product uh, related to Kubernetes. So stay tuned. Anyway, uh, the plan for this talk is as follows. I'd, I will first introduce the problem that uh, we were trying to solve. Uh, then I will give a high-level description of the uh, program that we developed uh, to solve this problem. I will talk a bit about the technologies used, uh, SurfRaft and uh, HTTP2. Uh, and then I will share some gory implementation details that I found interesting. I will try to do a demo. Hopefully, it will work. And then I will talk about what's missing and give some conclusion. So the problem uh, is basically uh, there's this uh, Enterprise systems that have all, a lot of legacy code and they're running, uh, you know, in mo big monoliths or something like that, and they want to communicate with uh, a Kima cluster. So Kima is this product by SAP. Uh, so it basically gives developers ways to easily uh, deploy their applications in a Kubernetes cluster, and it gives uh, some kind of serverless framework by default, so they can use Lambda functions and stuff like that. But for the purpose of this talk, just think of a regular Kubernetes cluster, because I actually haven't even run the Kima cluster. I'm just uh, dealing with playing Kubernetes. So they want to connect that cluster with some external services, and they want to do it in a transparent way. Uh, so they want to be transparent to client applications, and they want to reduce network latency between the cluster and the external system. And they also want to provide high availability and resilience in a simple way, so you can just deploy your application to this external system, and you don't need any Kubernetes or any fancy uh, distributed system. They just need something simple that can provide high availability. So um, yeah, I will give now a high-level description of the wormhole connector, which is what we call the, uh, this uh, project. Uh, so basically, it's just a distributed proxy. Uh, so being distributed, it provides high availability. And if a node goes down, it can continue uh, fine. Uh, it's based on using Surf and Raft, which are two distributed uh, algorithms, uh, which I will talk about a bit more uh, later. Um, and yeah, it connects the enterprise systems to Kima and Kima to enterprise systems. And it uses, uh, to do that, it uses an HTTP tunnel between uh, the, the enterprise system and, and Kima. So there's two uh, components of this. One is the wormhole connector proper that runs on the enterprise solution uh, side. And it's just a basic HTTP proxy. So ser services running on enterprise solution can talk to the Kima cluster by just setting the proxy variables there. Um, so all the connections received from the enterprise solution services, they will go through this tunnel to the uh, Kubernetes cluster. And you can find a project there. The other component is the one that runs on the actual Kubernetes cluster. Uh, and the, uh, what it does is it proxies the received connection from the tunnel to the services inside the cluster. But it also does the other way around. So it's also an HTTP proxy. Uh, so services inside the cluster can also talk to the enterprise uh, system. And uh, yeah, this is, uh, uh, yeah, it has a, some ex a small example implementation there inside the same repository. Uh, so I have to say that this project was more of like a proof of concept, so don't expect like a finalized software. Uh, so yeah, just a heads up. Um, so I want to talk a bit about the technologies involved, uh, Surf and Raft first. Uh, so yeah, Surf is a GoZip uh, distributed protocol. And uh, yeah, it basically uh, allows you to have some cluster membership and to pass some messages to all the, the, the members of your cluster. So you can see there in this uh, GIF I found on the internet uh, that some node receives some kind of message, and it goes to the other nodes, because one node talks to another node, and then the other node talks to others. So in the end, the whole cluster will know uh, this message that is being sent. 
Yeah, so we use this in the wormhole connector to basically add new members. So basically, you just need to start the wormhole connector and, and tell it, OK, there's a, here's another member, and then it will join the cluster. And uh, yeah, it, will also pro it, it also provides a, a way to know when a member has disconnected to remove it from the cluster. And then we use Raft, which is a consensus algorithm. It's used by things like etcd and console. And basically, with Raft, you have some certain state that you want to have in your cluster. And you want to have it consistent. So if you query uh, other members of the cluster, they have all the same view of the state. And uh, yeah, it provides a leader election. So you can have a leader that is doing all the right operations. And then the others are followers who can, uh, you know, you can read from them and get the same state. So. Uh, in wormhole connector, we use that to elect a leader, of course, and we store some state in the rough SSM, which is a finite state machine. And uh, yeah, for now, it's this, this is just a simple array, but this has some application in this context because there's this concept of event bus uh, events. And uh, yeah, basically, the uh, this legacy system can send events to the cluster, and we have to save the state there uh, somewhere in the cluster, so uh, we can have retries and we can have uh, yeah uh, things like that. Uh, in the future, you will start those events I was talking about, but for now it's just a simple array of strings because, as I said, it's a proof of concept. Yeah, so if you want to learn more about Raft in a more detailed way, there's a lot of uh, good resources on the internet. There's this page that has some nice visualizations and the explanations. And of course, you can also read the Raft paper, uh, which is uh, pretty good. Um, yeah, so as I said, I just implemented a, a simple uh, queue. And you just send an event to one of the members here, connector one, for example. And then you can read it from another uh, member, and you will see that the same event is there. You can also delete the events. And yeah, that's basically the, the uh, toy API that uh, we've implemented. So talking about some other technology, HTTP2. Uh, basically, this is just uh, the main differences between HTTP1 and HTTP2. So HTTP2 provides uh, header compression, so things are more efficient. And it's a binary format, so it's uh, also a way to improve efficiency. And the most important part for us uh, was that it has request response multiplexing. That means that with a single TCP connection, you can have several uh, connections, HTTP connections, and they don't need several TCP connections like with HTTP 1. Um, yeah, so it's something like this. Uh, you have some uh, HTTP2 connection, which is a TCP connection between the client and the server. And then you have different streams. So this can be totally different data. Um, and it will reuse the TCP connection. So you don't have to do the handshake uh, again or the HTTPS negotiation. It's just a, a tunnel that stays there. So uh, I will talk now about uh, some implementation details of this. Uh, yeah, first of all, the libraries I've used are the HashiCorp ones. And uh, they were pretty cool because they were simple to use. Uh, basically, for example, for surf, you just have some default config. You configure some values like the bind uh, address you are listening on and uh, stuff like that. And you just create a surf instance. And then you just get the events when a, cluster, uh, when a uh, member joins the cluster or leaves the cluster. So that was pretty cool. And for RAF, uh, same thing. So you need some kind of uh, store on disk. Um, we've chosen the Bolt uh, DB store because of simplicity. Um, you just create a new store, uh, create an, a snapshot store, which can be backed by a file, for example. Uh, you need to choose a transport. We chose a simple TCP. And then you need to um, give the, this finite state machine implementation. Uh, I'll talk about that in the next slide. And then you just start the Raft um, uh, yeah, object. And yeah, that's pretty much it. So it's pretty easy to use. Uh, and yeah, well documented. So this F FSM thing, oops, sorry, this FSM uh, interface is just something, some abstraction that the Raft library has, so you can uh, have a finite state machine of your own data structure. So in this example, I just have uh, this Go structure, which has some uh, uh, slice of uh, events, which are just simple strings, and then some mutex to avoid uh, yeah, problems with concurrency. 
and then you have to implement these operations. Um, so, yeah, you can uh, change this structure and store whatever you want, and this state will be replicated through all the members of your cluster. So that was pretty neat, too. Uh, one thing that to mention here is that uh, the write operations are only, uh, you can only do it on the uh, leader, and that simplifies things for the uh, protocol implementation. So what we do basically is just, if there's a write re a request, we redirect to the leader, and then uh, the request will be written. So this is the basic architecture of, uh, like the full picture of this uh, uh, thing I was talking about, this project. <laughs> so you see here that there's a wormhole connector, and it has several boxes, so it's this, this distributed part. So the part on the left is this enterprise system, and the part of the right is the Kima cluster, or Kubernetes. Uh, so basically, you see here two connections, one in red on top. Uh, that's between the client and some Kubernetes services, service inside the cluster. And basically, the client just sets a proxy to connect through the wormhole connector. The wormhole connector will have a tunnel to the wormhole dispatcher running in the cluster. And then the wormhole dispatcher will do the uh, dispatching of the traffic to the services inside the uh, Kubernetes cluster. You also have the other way around. So you have a Kubernetes pod there uh, in blue, I guess, uh, that it's also configured with a proxy to the wormhole dispatcher, and then the connection will be routed to, through the tunnel again back to the connector and connected to a server in this enterprise system. Uh, so yeah, that's pretty much the architecture diagram. Um, um, yeah, so some other details uh, to, to uh, be able to do this of only using one TCP connection. Uh, uh, Golang has a very simple way of doing this. So you just create your HTTP client. Uh, this HTTP client content contains some transport. And as long as you use the same HTTP client, your requests will be routed through this one connection. Uh, so this is a pretty neat API, and it's easy to use. And yeah, it just works. We didn't have to care uh, much about how. Um, and then tunnels, yay. So <laughs> this is uh, some chunk of code on a slide, so I guess it's not so nice. But uh, I can try to uh, go through it. So basically, we have here two things. One is if the, the connection going through the proxy is HTTPS, it uses this connect uh, method for HTTP and creates a tunnel to the, to the, um, yeah, to the other endpoint. And this is so because we don't want to, uh, you know, uh, get the unencrypted information in the proxy. So we need to do a tunnel. Uh, on the other case, it's just a simple HTTP without encryption. So uh, it, the proxy will just remove some headers and will just pass the, the connection to the to the other side, and then we'll read the response. And then, yeah, that's pretty much it. Uh, for HTTPS, we create this tunnel, and this tunnel reuses the same client. Uh, so it will reuse the connection uh, for the tunnel. Uh, and then, yeah, you have, we have some details there. If it's HTTP 1, you have to hijack the connection. If it's, if it's HTTP 2, you cannot do that, because if you hijack the whole connection, the other streams on the connection will die. Uh, so you do something else. But yeah, you get the idea. Um, it was pretty, pretty easy. Uh, one other interesting thing is we're doing is, if, we go, if I go back to the diagram, uh, uh, yeah, there's a connection from the dispatcher to the connector, but we don't want to. You know, we don't want the dispatcher to know the address of the connector. So uh, what we did here is we did some kind of reverse tunnel. So the, the connector will connect to the dispatcher, and then the the roles will be inverted, and then the client will be the dispatcher, and the server will be the connector. So this is on. Uh, this way in Go. So basically, the dispatcher will accept some TCP connection. You can create a transport with that, and then you can t tell the transport to return uh, the connection that was established before uh, to be the, uh, the transport. And then you can create a client, and then you can just do uh, get or whatever. On the other side, uh, you basically, this is the other side, so the connector will dial to the dispatcher. And once you have this connection, you can just set up a new server and tell it to serve the connection on this uh, TCP connection. So basically, you do the yeah a reverse uh, tunnel. Um, right. So now I'm going to try to do some demos. Um, so let's see if they work. 
Mm, let me change my screen configuration. Hopefully, I don't break any video. Maybe I did. <laughs> Can you see anything, Daniel? Mm. Okay. Okay. Well, there's some. Yeah, there we go. All right. So, well, let's start with this other demo. So, I'm going to start three instances of the wormhole connector, and they are going to be running in rocket containers, so I can have, uh, yeah. Yeah, just because I developed a lot of on Rocket and it's just easier for me. Um, yeah, I guess this is a very long command, but this and it doesn't really render properly. <laughs> but this basically sets up a bunch of options, starts the uh, the workflow connector process, and yeah, that's pretty much it. And now you can see that here it says the node is a follower, and then it gets promoted to a leader because there's only one member in the cluster. So now we'll start a, uh, some, a couple more, telling it the address of one of the members. So yeah, now we have here two followers uh, in the, at the bottom and one leader here. So now I, I was just, I'm just going to show this API that I've mentioned uh, of a simple distributed queue. So I can just, I don't know, post some event, event one to the first, uh, the leader. And yeah, that works fine. I can just get it uh, from the same leader. I get here event one. Or I can get it from another node. It's the same result. And yeah, I can just. Uh, Post again another one, like event two. I can post it to, I don't know, another node, like three. And But for this, I need to enable redirection, so dash L. And now, if I get an event from any, oh, I posted the same, oh no, yeah. So it still has the old event because I haven't deleted it yet. So let's do that. And now if we query again, we see event two. We can delete that too, and yeah, that's the same. So that's one demo of, of this uh, FSM thing. Now I want to show another demo of the whole uh, workflow. So I have a Minikube Kubernetes cluster running, and um, yeah, you can see that it's running this wormhole dispatcher uh, service I was mentioning. So now I can start the wormhole connector. Um, just yeah, I set up some entries in my Etsy, ho Etsy hosts, <laughs> so certificates work. But basically, I'm connecting to the uh, to the dispatcher, and now you see this connected to wormhole dispatcher. So this means that the reverse connection was established. And now what I'm gonna do is, uh, yeah, I have here an echo server service inside the Kubernetes cluster, and this just returns. Uh, the some information about a request that you made. So it's just a simple like ping pong kind of thing. Uh, but this is running on the Kubernetes cluster. So in theory, I shouldn't be able to access it uh, in my, on my host. But if I set the proxy to be the connector wormhole.io, this is an address pointing to this uh, wormhole connector and some certificates so I can trust the CA. Then I can just uh, use this uh, URL, which is the name of a Kubernetes service with this port, and I'll just get a response. You can see here that there's an outgoing HTTP connection, and this goes to the cluster, and it connects to this service inside. Um, yeah, so I can do this several times, and then if I do net stat, you still see only two connections uh, going to that Kubernetes cluster. One is the reverse tunnel, and the other one is the uh, other tunnel. So the other thing I can do is just run some pod. kubectl uh, run. OK, so I'm running an Alpine pod. Um, I'm passing the CA here in an M variable. Uh, so the thing is trusted. So hopefully this will start. Mm 
doesn't want to start. Still creating. I guess I'm downloading the thing on the network. Oh, yeah. And this is a nice bug about kubectl, of my version at least, that if you have a, already an, an image of the same name running, I mean, a, a deployment of the same name running, it just crashes. That's neat. OK, this for some reason it doesn't work, but uh, what this demo will show is that you can get uh, to a pod inside the Kubernetes cluster, configure the proxy to be the dispatcher, and then it will connect to my host. Uh, I was going to show it by just running netcat here, but this doesn't seem to work. Oh, it's running. So hopefully I can attach to it. Good. So, yeah. Let me pull some instructions here because I don't want to. Uh, yeah. Okay, internet is not really working well. Yeah, anyway, you could trust me that this works, <laughs> and <laughs> that's it. Okay, so the missing pieces here, uh, uh, yeah. One thing that you notice is that there was two TCP connections, one on one side and one on the other side. Um, I would think that theoretically it's possible to use just one TCP connection, and that was the goal in the beginning, but I didn't manage to do it in the time that we had to work on this project. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure if with the Go API you can do this or not, or you have to do some other weird stuff, so if you have any ideas about this, please let me know. Um, yeah, and the other thing that's missing is this events support that I, that I was mentioning. So basically, the enterprise uh, uh, solution will send some event to the cluster, and we will be able to store the events uh, and try to um, deliver them to the cluster. And if that fails, we can do retries and all that stuff. So that's not implemented. And si even though this is a simple uh, the, uh, program that you can run to run to create a cluster on the enterprise side. Uh, we also want to support deploying that in Kubernetes. And for that, of course, you don't need any serif or raft because Kubernetes already provides the distributed uh, primitives that you need. Um, there's some work in progress implementation, but uh, yeah, we didn't have much time. So yeah, in conclusion, uh, yeah, so we've implemented two clients of distributed system libraries, two proxies, two HTTP tunnels, so a lot of two. Uh, we learned a lot of this, uh, these things because this is not something we've worked on before, and we had a lot of fun. So, yeah, I hope, uh, yeah, you enjoy this talk. Thanks, and yeah. <laughs> if you have any questions, uh, yeah. So we have about five. We have about five minutes for questions. Yeah. So. I assume the proxy sidecar, the proxy pods, have to run in host networking. Uh, sorry? The, in Kubernetes, I assume the proxy pods have to run in host networking? Mm, no, they don't. Oh, OK. Um, so they, they just connect to this Kubernetes service, and they will get to that uh, dispatcher thing. And yeah, that will get routed. And then connections into the cluster. So from the external cluster into the Kubernetes cluster. OK, so which cluster you, you were meaning before? Uh, I meant uh, somebody talking outside, contacting the target Kubernetes cluster. OK, that's running on the host, yeah. That's running. So, okay, the the service the servers running the host network and then talking to the okay. Gotcha. Yeah, I thought you meant the services in the Kubernetes cluster. It's kind of confusing. So, if there are no there are no other questions, I have one. Yeah. So, how do do you authenticate? Like, how do you, uh, how do the Kubernetes cluster and the enterprise cluster authenticate? It's just via HTTPS certificates, or do you have something yeah. additional on top of that? No, just HTTPS certificates. So, basically. The authentication between the proxy and the client application is via, via HTTPS certificates, of course. And then uh, you have to specify some CA that you trust for the Kubernetes cluster. And so the, the, the certificate for the Kubernetes cluster endpoint has to be uh, signed by that cert CA. So it's just. So, like in regular CLS. Kubernetes? Yeah. Okay. Thank you for the talk. Oh. Is this on? Thank you for the talk. Um, so you have this thing where you do the reverse proxy and you basically do an accept on a listening socket. Mm -hmm. uh, and how do you make sure that there's a connection ready when you need it, basically? Sorry? How do you make sure that there's a connection ready to be accepted when you need to dial out, essentially? 
Um, yeah, so it's basically just a loop that listens on a port. And if it gets a connection there, uh, then, uh, then uh, yeah, it knows uh, with some headers, it knows that it's from the wormhole connector. And then it, it does this logic of uh, doing the reverse thing. I'm not sure if that makes sense. So it's just a very simple implementation. Uh, we didn't do anything fancy. Cool. So thanks. And yeah, enjoy the conference. Thanks, Iago. <laughs>